When Jackie with the blonde hair does her talk, she'll just let yeah. me introduce you. Okay. challenge we have to face is, is Wall Street. And so we're going to be talking about a lot of different ideas here of how we can begin to break away from Wall Street and, and create that new economy, take it further than it's already gone. We have a lot of great panelists, and I'll introduce them as they, as they come to speak. Uh, we're going to start with Jackie Dunn. Uh, Jackie's issue is, we should make that a full screen, shouldn't we? Yeah, uh, oh, they still have ready to use it? Are we ready for you to use it? I hope so. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. Jackie Dunn is, uh, has written a great book. We just had her on a radio show. We have a, Margaret and I have a radio show each Monday called Clearing in the Fog. It's clearingthefogradio.org. We just had Jackie on to talk about her book, Rethinking Money. And it's a lot of new ideas to us. But I think as you'll hear from Jackie, it's not actually new ideas. They're, they're actually in place around the world. And there is a long experience with them. And they actually help the economy both. Uh, the, <coughs> You know, dominant uh, currency in the country, as well as uh, people who aren't able to completely access that dominant currency. So, please welcome Jackie Dunn. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Roya has uh, 
password to uh, change the slide, so I'm going to ask you to do it manually. So here we go. Next slide. Next slide. So no matter <laughs> what way you look at it, either from the top down, from the bottom up, from the left, or from the right, we are in trouble. And if anybody here in this room, uh, I think you all know that we're all in trouble because we come from cities, from towns that cannot pay for their fire brigade, their police service, school budgets are being slashed, there isn't the money to create new jobs. And if you have not experienced that or don't know that, I would submit to you that you've been herding yaks in some remote village in uh, Tibet somewhere and have been hermetically sealed and beamed down in this room. So I think everybody in this world is feeling that there is a system in, tr in trouble. Next slide, please. And it's not just a visceral feeling that we have. The International Monetary Fund themselves have actually said that there have been in a 40-year period from the 1970s to 2010, no less than 425 systemic monetary crisis. They come in different flavors. There are banking crisis, which we all felt here in 2008 with our, our US banking crisis that actually went global. We have had monetary crashes, and what that means is the money system itself has crashed. We had that with the ruble and the Argentine peso. And sovereign debt, which you've heard about with Greece and in Spain, and to some sense at my own native Ireland, where the country itself uh, is having problems with its own financial system. So what we're seeing is that although the newspapers and our, our modern media keep on reporting these things like, oh my god, this is breaking news, folks, in fact, it is a recurring problem. It's a systemic problem. And we don't report it as a systemic problem. We talk about it as this, this flash, this extraordinary flash in the pan. Next uh, slide for you. So we have a monetary system that is basically on autopilot. And if you can imagine everybody getting into their carousel chair and not remembering where the on and off switch is. So I'm going to actually explain how we get to that on and off switch. Next for you. Uh, just to keep it very, very brief, you know, how did we get the current system of money that we have today? And my colleagues uh, will be talking very eloquently about uh, banking and banking systems, but we need, I need to refer to it very, very briefly so you actually understand how we can have new monetary agreements. And the word bank comes from the Italian word banco, which means uh, bench. And it's where the uh, goldsmiths in the 1500s in Italy um, exchange gold, and these guys were the ones that had the strong boxes, and it seemed to make sense to actually keep your gold and your precious metals and your coins in their strong boxes. And they realized that um, you know you'd come in and you'd take X amount of gold, gold pieces or silver pieces that you needed to spend. But the goldsmiths, being very very observant, realized that a lot of the gold pieces and gold and silver were actually remained in the strong boxes. And they started writing these um, receipts. So you could actually take the receipt rather than extracting the gold or taking the gold out of the strong box. Uh, and you'd have a signed document from the goldsmith saying that you actually had this amount of gold in the strong box. And they realized also that not all the gold was going in and out. So they started writing receipts for more than was actually in the strong box. So out of that actually became the idea of modern money that you and I use every day. Boya, please. What became systematized was with the advent of central banking that happened in, first of all, by the Bank of Sweden. And the king at that time needed to fight a war against the Danes, and he needed money. So the uh, Bank of Sweden, which was this fiat-based type of money, uh, told the king of Sweden that they would, of course, lend them the money that they needed, but they had to make sure that this money became de rigueur, the, the ordinary money that would be used by all, all Swedes. And 20 years later, uh, William of Orange had to fight a war against the French, and he also had to go to the Bank of England to get a loan in order to fight. And the, the similar agreement was reached. Next slide, Royal. 
So the modern money that you use today, whether you're using a euro, whether you're using a pound sterling, or the almighty dollar, they're all the same type of money. The pictures may be different, but they're designed, they're DNA. And I do use the term DNA very pointedly because it, it, there is almost like a programming, if you like, a functional dynamic that comes out of using this money. So they're all fiat-based, which means there's nothing backing them. Um, they're hierarchical. They are um, created by a monopoly. Uh, they're scarcer than their usefulness. And that breeds competition, which I can explain a bit later. And they're all interest-based. Roy, please. So this is probably one of the most pivotal things for you to come away with. What gives this worthless piece of paper, essentially, uh, its value? Why we compete with one another to get it is we are obliged to pay our taxes in this currency. And that's how the private banking system, going back to the British, going back to the Swedes, how they actually institutionalize this form of money. Please. And the justification, if you talk to any banker or any economist, is, well, it's efficient. We've got one type of money. It does everything. It's really efficient. Next, please. So, but we're at an extraordinary period in time. If you just uh, keep. Um, promoting those, keep moving forward. Thank you. <clears throat> We're in this sort of 20 year period where a number of, well, I would say, societal trends are actually ending. If you look at the big one, we're dealing with patriarchy, we're dealing with the end of hyper rationalism, we're dealing with the end of modernism, we're dealing with the end of the industrial age, and the end of the Cold War. And we're at this inflection point in society where we get to reimagine. <coughs> Next slide, please. <coughs> For the first time in our history, it will be possible to democratize money. Because historically, money has either been created by the king and the queen, by royalty, and their uh, subjects are obliged to use it, or by a private cartel of banks as we've seen through the Bank of England and through the Bank of Sweden. So now we have this amazing inflection point because not only do we have cheaper computing, mobile telephony, we have access to the internet, we have all this amazing social media, we also have the ability to access wisdom from all the ages because it's all there on the internet. You know, five seconds on the internet, you can find it anything you want to know. We are using an industrial type money, a money used for a different, in a different time for a different set of prerogatives. This industrial type use, uh, money was brilliant because it brought about the industrial revolution because before then it was simply impossible to ha get money, to make money out of money. You either had to inherit it, you had to marry into it, you could steal it, you fought wars over it. But for the first time, they created this brilliant thing called fiat debt money. And it, was, it gave us the resources that initiated the Industrial Revolution and has given us this amazing standard of living. However, we're at a very different point in our evolution at this time. You know, uh, there aren't, you know, we have scarce resources. Um, we're not trying to build nation states. We have a different <coughs> set of priorities. And I would suggest to you, with, uh, with your open hearts and your willingness to come here and to explore democratization, not only of energy, you're talking about education, you're talking about government, every single thing that you are empowered and impassioned to change in this world, you will not be able to do it completely or fully until you rethink the money system. And that's because of the functional dynamics of scarcity, the functional dynamics of interest, which we can go into much more when we do our workshop tomorrow. You will see that it will be impossible to have the egalitarian society, the cooperative society that you long for, not only to experience in your own lives, but also to bequeath to our children and our grandchildren. Next. 
Um, so what is money? M um, economists will give you a lot of definitions to it. I won't go into them, but essentially they say what money does. They don't say what money is. Next, please. It is basically a human construct. It lives in the space of agreement. An agreement like in a marriage, for example. An agreement to join a particular political uh, party. It is a, an agreement within a community to use something standardized as a mean of exchange. Now, a community can be described in many, many ways. It could be a business community. It could be a community in a village, in a town, in a state. It could be a transnational. Uh, However you want to describe or your particular community, it is an agreement, a conscious <coughs> agreement within that community to use something standardized as a mean of exchange. Next, please. So what is happening all around the world is there is an advent of communities coming together and realizing that they have the man power, they have a woman power, they have the genius, they have the inspiration to do great things, but they're lacking money. We keep uh, flying, flying through this here, Roya, thank you. And basically, they have very different designs. And basically, I think just to encapsulate it, they are cooperative in the design, and they don't carry interest, or they have something called a negative interest rate, which we can actually explore in deeper in conversation tomorrow. But they are totally antithetical to the bank debt, fiat-based money. They're usually backed by something like time, it could be a resource or whatever. Moving right ahead, um, we keep going. So they're designed to be insufficiency which is a huge thing. They're designed to be in sufficiency. There is no scarcity. They are usually backed by commodities, I said. The accounting is transparent. And good currencies are non-hierarchical. They are uh, also, they are hyper-democratic. Uh, and they're designed to empower that particular community they're, uh, they're designed to serve. Oh, yeah. Next one. I think one of the great insights I've got, I've been on a, a book tour, and in conversation, I came to realize that money is a public utility. Money is, can be organized as a commons, like how you would uh, organize the use of land among a number of people. So we can get more into this uh, tomorrow in our conversation. But if we run our money system as it were a commons, as it was a utility, it opens up great possibilities. I think we can just slide through these quickly. Next one. To say that there isn't sufficient money in our society is like saying to an architect there aren't enough inches to build a house, or to an engineer there aren't enough miles to build a roadway. It's crazy. And once we understand that money is an agreement, there is a possibility of there being sufficiency for whatever we want to do. Next, please. So what do complementary currencies do? They link unused resources with unmet needs. So what are unused resources? There is labor. There is talent. I mean, you, you, the list is endless, and our needs are also uh, endless, but we can design currencies, and we can talk about this tomorrow, that will link an unused resource with an unmet need. Um, there are roughly about 6,000 um, complementary currencies that have a social purpose around the world, and there are a handful of very, very interesting B2B business uh, currency uh, in the world, too. Next, please, Roy. So I want to tell you a story, a very practical story, so sort of taking it out of the ethers and, th and theory into a really interesting case study. So this looks like an absolutely beautiful um, arboretum. And before this arboretum was actually built, Roya, it was a garbage dump. And this is not Photoshop, this is actual <laughs> photographs from their garbage dump. If you continue on, Roya, please. Absolutely disgusting. So there was this, um, can you go back one, please? Back one. 
<laughs> Sorry, I might cause consternation over there. <laughs> if, it's, if it's too difficult, just leave it. Yeah. So basically, um, this is in the town of Cura, Curitiba, Brazil. And, pardon me? There we go, we got it. We got it. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Curitiba, Brazil had a lot of favelas. A lot of people were coming into this town in uh, the southeast of Brazil in order to find a better life. And they were building these shanty towns, basically very, very marginalized housing that was made out of corrugated iron and cinder block. And the pathways between the houses were so narrow that the garbage trucks could not go up the, um, up the pathways to collect the garbage. And as a result, they were stunk. There was a lot of disease. But the mayor of Curitiba at the time, Jaime Lerner, did not have any money. Sounds familiar? No money to do what he needed to do. But what he did have is a bus service that was running around the city half full. Right here. So this is the modern version. As you can see, uh, a bus comes up, about eight doors open. Everybody has paid their token, which is a token to get on the bus. So, the mayor said, wow, what if I send out a notice to the favelas? Everybody that comes in with a bag of garbage that is actually straightened out between paper, glass, uh, biodegradables, whatever it is, they will get a token to ride on the buses. So within a matter of two weeks, three weeks at the most, the favelas of Curitiba were picked clean and large vats were put around the whole circumference of the favelas in different colors so people could deposit the various types of garbage that were actually sorted. And they all got these tokens to ride in the bus. So, this just shows you how it works. People get on and off very, very quickly. Next one, please. So, um, people started riding the buses and then the uh, local farmers started to accept a payment for vegetables and fruit that were grown locally in these tokens. What Jaime Lerner had done is created a currency. He took an unmet need, which was, um, you know, the garbage situation in Curitiba, and the unused resource, which was the talents and skills of the people. And this grew into this great food um, a bank uh, service that they offered. Next one. And this is one of my favorite slides. Um, Fishermen, on days that the fish are not biting, can actually go out into the seas and trawl for garbage and bring them in to the uh, sorting depot and they actually get paid for the garbage. So, so they're having this massive cleanup. Next one. What is interesting about Curitiba is that Jaime Lerner, who is an architect, designed several more different types of currencies linking unused resources with unmet needs. And as a result of the people of Curitiba having access to complementary currencies, and they're called complementary currencies because they do not replace the real or the dollar or the national currency, they act in tandem. The average person in Curitiba had a standard of living that was one third higher than anybody else living in Brazil. And with this public money, they were able to build these beautiful parks. I think there are about 14 beautiful parks like this all through Curitiba. One thing I want you to remember, people say, oh my God, if we could just have more money. It's not a case about how much more money, it's the type of money that we're using. Yes, dollars, uh, pounds, uh, yen, are fabulous as international tools for trade, but locally you can design currencies that can be imbued with the values that you hold dear. Finally, I would ask you never to give up. No matter what your vision is for anything you're doing to restore social justice, to get equality, do look to, do look to how you can create a currency to link an unused resource with an unmet need. And I tell you, you will have success. Thank you. Wow. Uh, so Jackie will be speaking tomorrow at 9 o'clock in uh, D333. I want to get more in depth in this. She has a lot more great stories that one story is just one of many.
Um, and there's a lot more to know about this complementary currency. It's a very powerful force. Uh, the um, next speaker, Ellen Brown, is um, really, I think, the, the leading thinker on public banking. Uh, she's involved with the Public Banking Institute. What's your role there? Chairman or president? President. It's a hierarchical structure, what can I say? Um, uh, she's an author of multiple books. Her most recent book is The Public Banking Solution. And public banking, I think, is one of those great issues uh, that is, again, pulling money away from Wall Street. Uh, right now, we all, our property taxes, our state taxes, our, all of our local taxes are <coughs> held in Wall Street banks. And that just feeds the beast. And so creating a public bank and putting that money into the Bank of Missouri, the Bank of Wisconsin, the Bank of Madison, and using that, uh, all that revenue that comes in from the local uh, you know, uh, spending, and uh, all the money that the local government has gets put in that bank and can be used like other banks do to leverage more money. So it just empowers a local community. It just makes so much sense. And Ellen Brown really has been a leader on that. So I don't know if I didn't say too much. I probably said too much. Ellen Brown. All right. Um, so I'm going to argue that we can do the same thing with, our, with a public bank, basically create money uh, the way that all banks do. But banks now do it for themselves for the benefit of Wall Street, and they cream all the profits off the top. So if we own our own publicly owned banks, this is not, I'm not talking about credit unions, but actually our governments, state, local, even federal, although we actually have no control over our federal government. Mm -hmm. like, so that's why we're working at the local level where we can actually have an effect. Um, if we can get public banks set up, we can generate our own credit that will do whatever is needed in the public interest. Um, our number one problem today, financially, is debt. Everybody seems to be in debt. Individuals are in debt. State and local governments are in debt. Fe uh, federal governments are in debt. They're all in debt. So who are they in debt to if everybody is in debt? They're in debt to commercial banks. And the reason is that the banks actually create our money, and they create it as debt. The, the problem, though, is the mathematical flaw in this model is that they create the debt at interest. So they always need more money paid back than, than they put out there in the first place. So there's never enough money in the system to pay principal plus interest. And you can see this particularly in uh, Europe, where they're in the Eurozone, where they are restricted to, their central banks are not allowed to issue new money. And so they're restricted to the amount of money they have. And therefore, they're all in debt because they're, they're all trying to pay back these debts plus interest and there's no place to get the euros except from each other. Um, so so there, nobody, even Germany, which is the, the, um, supposedly the most functional of the, of the eurozone countries, it, it's hopelessly in debt as well. Um, even the, debt, the banks themselves are in debt. You might say, how, how, why would that be if they can create the money themselves? But, uh, they create it by double entry bookkeeping. So they create it in the first instance on their books. If you come to the bank for a mortgage, say, you will sign this piece of paper called a mortgage, and they will put that, write that up on one side of their books as an asset to themselves, meaning that you will pay them that sum over time. And then they'll write that on the other side of their books as a liability to themselves because when you write checks on the deposit account that they're going to open up for you in that sum, they will be on the hook for whatever, whatever the sum of the check is when that check goes into another bank. So they have to cover that check in some way, which means they borrow the money just like, like every, as everybody else is borrowing, they too are borrowing, but they are sucking up the cheapest form of money. So if they, ha if they have enough in their deposit, the ideal place for them to get the money is their deposits, because that's the cheapest place they can get it to borrow from the deposit pool. So some banks don't pay anything on deposits, or if they do pay something, it's like extremely little interest. But if they don't have the deposits, the Federal Reserve 
they, all the checks have to clear through the Federal Reserve or some other clearinghouse. The Federal Reserve counts it as um, as an overdraft on their account with the Federal Reserve, and then they so now they the Federal Reserve lends to them at 0.75 percent. So they now have a debt to the Federal Reserve, and they're supposed to clear that overnight. So what they do, they can either get it from other banks at the Fed funds rate, which is 0.25 percent. So it's extremely low. They can borrow extremely low, or they can get it from the money markets or the repo market. The repo market is it's a blatant fraud, actually, but it, it works for accounting pur purposes. What they do is they borrow overnight. So that so whoever owns the, the money uh, agrees that they will that they will lend it overnight, but they will they will take it back in the morning. So whoever's money it is gets it during the day, and the bank gets it at night. So it looks like the bank's books are, are balanced, and then it doesn't matter what they do during the day, because they only have to balance at night. So they just borrow this money from somebody else who has it overnight, and then they give it back during the day. So that's that's what they call liquidity, that they have to have the, the ability to get this liquidity, liquidity to cover their assets, which are their loans that they've made with other people's money, essentially. And if, if they can't get the money, then, then they have a liquidity crisis, and, the, and that's what happened in 2008, and what no doubt will happen again. So because there's this um, continual imperative for growth, we have what we have is an exponential growth of debt, which ultimately will reach an, an unsustainable, it's a, it's a pyramid scheme, and we're at that point right now where First, we went from exploiting other countries, you know, trapping everybody in debt, and then trapping our own housing market in debt, and then that bubble burst, and then, then now we have the derivatives bubble, which conservatively is $600 trillion. Some people say it's two quadrillion dollars, which when I was a child was an imaginary number. <laughs> <laughs> All that you are quadrillion dollars, which meant, you know, a number that would have been possible. So, say 600 trillion is 10 times the gross domestic product of all the countries in the world. So this is clearly an unsustainable scheme. And these are our large Wall Street banks that are the major players in this game. Um, two of the major banks that our state governments tend to put their money in because they have to use Wall Street because they, they need it for, well, there are various reasons why they need a really big bank. So they need these big international banks J.P. Morgan Chase and Bank of America both have over $70 trillion in derivatives, and they have over $1 trillion in deposits. And because Glass-Steagall has never been reinstated, um, they are allowed to commingle these two types of dealings that they do. So, that, so their deposit pool of $1 trillion is what they use to back their derivatives. This, this casino, this derivatives casino, which must and will collapse, just like the 2008 collapse of um, Lehman Brothers. Lehman Brothers is an investment bank. They did not take deposits. Well, now we have these big investment banks that are taking deposits, our deposits. And we now have Dodd-Frank, which um, supposedly fixed the credit crisis. But in fact, what it says, it, they didn't reimpose Glass-Steagall separating investment um, banks banking from depository banking, what they did was they said, well, we're going to let you play in your casino, but if you get in trouble for another big derivatives bust like, like Lehman Brothers did, we, the taxpayers, are not going to bail you out. So that means we are covered by $25 billion. That's the limit of the FDIC insurance fund, which is less than 2% of all the deposits that they supposedly guarantee. It used to be that the FDIC could get their money from the Treasury. They, you know, they had a credit line with the Treasury, which, which all the member banks had to pay back, which was pretty stressful, even when they went over by, by six billion, and next time they're liable to go over by 700 billion, which was what the last big bust was. But now, the Treasury is gonna say, sorry, Dodd-Frank says that we, the people, are not going to, you know, we can't bail out these banks, so, so, so what they have done, the new model is called the bail-in, and we saw that in Cyprus, where bail-in means they're going to use our deposits to recapitalize the banks. 
because their banks must stay alive no matter what. The, the deal and the derivatives must, the whole de derivative scheme must stay in place because it's this huge house of cards and if you take a couple of cards out from the bottom, the whole thing collapses and our deposits go with it. So basically they have a gun to our heads. It's like, we've got your money, so you've got to bail us out. You keep bailing us out or bail us in if the taxpayers won't bail us out. So this whole scheme is due to collapse and probably will, will collapse. I mean, ideally we would set up another model and just move into it quietly and, and no, no great catastrophe. But historically, that's not the way it happens. Usually change happens when things fall apart. For example, in Argentina, when people could not get their money out of the banks, that's when they went to printing their own money at various levels. They printed their own pesos at the federal level, and you know, they told the creditors to go away, meaning largely the IMF, and just started funding things internally, and it worked very well. They got the system, um, they got the economy back on its feet. Iceland did that, um, told the creditors to go away. I mean, a great model is actually Germany in the 1930s, where uh, Hitler said, we don't have the money. Um, he realized that they didn't have any gold, so they weren't going to have a gold-based currency, and they just they just opted out of the international monetary scheme and started issuing their own money just like this little town did in Brazil. They weren't called bus tokens. They were a form of bond, but they, it circulated as money. And so Hitler set up this, or the, who was actually um, shocked with his, uh, was the head of the Reichsbank at that time. They set up this plan where it, um, there were different things they wanted to do, build an autobahn, and they did housing. And they had all these different projects they wanted to achieve. They put people, they hired people, paid them with these bonds, and just rebuilt the country. So the country, was, the economy was thriving when every, the rest of the world was in, um, in a huge depression, except for Japan. Um, Japan was doing the same model as Germany. In other words, they were just printing money and underwriting their um, industries. And that's why they, what even, well, I've written all this up in Public Bank Solutions, so I, I guess I don't have time to go into all this detail. But the point is, um, the next collapse will be our opportunity to set up another model. And the model that we can do that will um, be sustainable is what they've done in North Dakota. They have the Bank of North Dakota is publicly owned. It's the only uh, publicly owned depository bank in that country. They take the state's revenues uh, deposited in the bank, and then and they use well, technically all of the assets of the state are assets of the bank because it's set up as a DBA of the state. So they've got a huge huge capital base and a huge, huge deposit base so they can create the credit they need for all the things they need in the state. And it works very well and this, this has been written up quite a bit. So we can do that in all 50 states um, and get back on our feet. We can save uh, 35 to 40% in interest. That's what, um, that's what public projects cost on average. Of course, some of them are costing more than that now, now that they're using these, these loans that go over 20 years and they cost nothing in the beginning, but in the end, you wind up paying like five times the principal. So, so, there, so there, there is this public model that we can set up that also 40% of banks globally are publicly owned and they're largely in the countries that escape the credit crisis. That's Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Um, I'll be giving a, a presentation on Sunday where I'll do a, a long PowerPoint to explain all those things in detail, but that's the basic idea. How many people here try to buy local? Very good. You're all such good citizens. Um, well, we're going to talk about a little, another aspect of localism. Uh, and it's kind of a, a new and I think cutting edge idea that um, uh, is just really starting to be experimented with. And we have one of the lead experimenters here, uh, Rebecca Ryan, who is uh, with Lion in, Mad in, in Madison Dane County, a local, uh, local investment opportunity network. It tries to 
help people invest invest locally rather than going through the stock market and you know the, all the, the typical investments that we see take your money and help build your community and Rebecca Ryan has lead that effort in Madison thank you Um, really terrific to be with you um, here tonight. I'm actually going to wear two hats, but not simultaneously, because that would be confusing. Um, I have to start by admitting that, I don't know if you're familiar with that show, The Electric Company. When I was a kid, mm -hmm. it came on right after Mr. Rogers. And um, my mom hated that show, but I, which made me love it even more. Anyway, um, one of the things that they would do on The Electric Company, so it was a show for kids, and they would have this six box of like, kids in six different boxes and like five of them would be jumping rope and one would be bouncing a basketball right and the song was which of these kids is not like the other one come on tell me if you know right okay sparkle hands back there there's some co-op agreement here awesome so um you know and the job for the kid was to guess which kid was different right so with all of this amazing expertise on the panel these like these are all the jump ropers who are the actual experts, and I'm like the dork bouncing the basketball, just like trying this crap in my own backyard, right? So the first hat I want to wear is um, my passion project, which is LION, the acronym that stands for Local Investment Opportunity Network. I am not paid for this. I am a volunteer in my community. I started this because I just thought it was a damn good idea. So um, let me tell you sort of the two forces that led to this. Um, the first one was this, I get a magazine called Good Magazine, which unlike most of what we read, which is tear-jerking and heartbreaking, <laughs> Good Magazine celebrates what's good in our communities, what's good about the human spirit. And they did a money issue in um, between 2009 and 2010, like late 2009 or early 2010, it was about the first of the year, I remember that because I wasn't on the road working, I was home and I was able to read this magazine, and they wrote about this Lion Group, Local Investment Opportunity Network, in the state of Washington. And what these people had decided was they weren't going to get a, a bailout from the feds. This is like a tiny fishing town. Their fishing industry had been decimated. So these local people got together and they said, how can we invest in our own businesses? Our businesses need us right now. They are not getting any money from the banks. How do we do this? And I read that. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, here in Dade County, we are freaks about buying local. Like, we love going to the farmer's market, we love knowing our farmers, we, you know, the Dane by Local chapter is huge. I think we have 1,700 members in our time bank here in Dane County. Like, we love all this crazy nonsense. So I thought, I bet we here would probably also invest locally. So that happened. And not two weeks later, my wife, Marty, uh, came from the mailbox with our Edward Jones investment statements and um, she was by the way she's trained as an actuarial science she, scientist she has an MBA in finance she's like the spreadsheet in our family like if you can spreadsheet it she's like doing it right so she's the some spreadsheet in her family and she came home with this you know she came in from the mailbox she had our Edward Jones statements and she just threw hers on the table and again, late 2009, early 2010, some things were starting to get a little bit better. I could tell she was honked off. And I said, Marty, don't be upset. I said, I'm sure our investments look a little bit better now than they did you know, last quarter. And she said, I don't care which direction the graph is going. She said, I don't know what I own. I don't know who manages what I own. I have just, she used a few expletives, which I won't use because I am being recorded. Um, she said, I'm just, I had it with Wall Street. So between reading about this organization in this tiny town on the coast of the state of Washington, and then having my own partner, who's wicked smart about money and finances, say she's ready to just pull out, I thought, I'm going to give this a test drive. Let's kick the tires on this thing and see if Madison can make, it, can make this work. So I went to some people I know in the community who love to do local stuff and who I knew had a little pocket change and I asked would you be interested in investing in local businesses and that was two years ago and we now have I think about 24 investors we have three and a half million dollars probably more but that's what I can track down of availability um, and we have people who are taking their money off of Wall Street some very meticulously like we have one investor who's like every year he's taking 10% more of his investments out of his traditional vehicles and putting it into the local economy. 
and others who do it in a more haphazard way. Um, but we are investing in local businesses. We've had uh, over a dozen businesses come through our network, local businesses. So if you've eaten black earth meats, or if you've had um, creme de coulee cheese, if you've had kombucha, um, masala kombucha here, you have um, benefited from businesses that have been funded by local investors. They're not going to large banks, they are going to local investors. Yeah. <laughs> we know this can get bigger um, in Dane County, um, but I have to tell you, I'm sort of terrified of that because I have kind of a demanding day job, which I'm going to tell you about in just a second. Um, but even more importantly, every month I get three to four calls from communities like yours who say, I think we could do this in our community. And if you think you can do it in your community, you probably can. So earlier today, and we did live stream it. Is that captured, Kevin? Like, yes, is it also captured? So um, earlier today, we did a panel myself, Tara Johnson, who, um, if you're familiar, if you've been to Whole Foods uh, or your local co op and you've seen Tara's Way in the supplement section, that's her company. Um, she is kind of our resident expert on how businesses can use local. All of her business was funded by Wisconsin-based investors. Um, so she's kind of our resident expert on how businesses can use local money to scale their companies. Um, and then Mona Johnson, they're not related, they're both, they're, I guess Johnson kind of a popular last name. Um, <laughs> Mona Johnson is one of our most active investors and she gave the playbook on how they invest locally. It's not um, less time consuming, it's, it can be somewhat time consuming, but um, there is a community dividend that comes out of this. And from my perspective, um, that's one of the most rewarding things about Lion. Yes, we have matched millions of dollars. We have helped companies go from 30 miles an hour to 50 miles an hour. We have grown the job base. But the coolest thing that has come out of this is we have a community now of investors and businesses that know who each other are and that have each other's backs. And that is um, worth more than any amount of money. So um, that's a little bit about the Local Investment Opportunity Network. Um, and I want to leave you with just a note. In my real, my real job, I'm a futurist and I'm an economist. And um, six weeks ago, this is not shameless self-promotion because you can't even buy the book here. Um, but a few weeks ago, I came out with my new book, Regeneration, and it's about the future of America. And I just want to put this in context for you to keep some oil in your, in your uh, engines. Because I know that you're the front lines of change, and I know that um, as a person who also is trying to make change, you often get the arrows in your back. And it can be hard to get up again and again and again and again and do that. So I want to just leave you with a word of context for um, where I think America is. And Jackie, I love the slide about, well, I guess it was going like this, but all the five major movements that are like right. circling the drain right now. Um, when I wrote this book, um, Regeneration, I wrote it as a love letter to America's future leaders. Because I realized, um, I do a lot of work with young professionals, hundreds of thousands of young professionals, and I realized that they were being handed the keys to the car in the, at the same minute that we were being dealt a blizzard, right? The economy is a crap sandwich. The environment is a hot mess. I mean, you think about the nine tracks in this conference today, each one of them is in various states of oh crap, okay? <laughs> so, so here we have a new generation that is being handed the keys to the car in the middle of a snowstorm. So I wrote this book as a love letter to them because the truth is that America goes through spring, summer, fall, and winter cycles. And these, ha these take place about every 80 to 100 years, which is like God's little joke on us because our meat suits only last about 80 years. So no two-legged lives through an entire cycle. So every time we hit winter again, we don't have cellular memory of what it was like to live through winter the last time. America's been through four winters, the American Revolution, Civil War, Reconstruction, the Great Depression, and now this Great Recessionary period. And spring has always come again. But I just want to reinforce this. Those of us alive during winter, I believe that period started in 2001 and it'll last through about 2020. Those of us um, who are living uh, now during winter, we have a responsibility to make sure that when spring comes again, this country works better for more people. And we've done it three other times, and I believe we can do it again. 
So if you have the privilege of sucking oxygen off this beautiful blue dot at this moment in time, please be assured, spring will likely come again. We have to live with active hope. But will our efforts result in this country working better for more people or not? That is the promise of what I try to do on a big level every day. And it's the tiny little change I'm trying to make with Lyon here in Madison. So thanks for being at the Democracy Conference. As you all pay, I mean, I do think this is a group that's going to is on the cutting edge of change, and I hope you'll bring back to your communities so much what you heard here, and, and help to build the, the next economy and the, a more functional government in the future. We're hearing a lot of really cool stuff uh, from the speakers so far. We have one more left who will also bring us some cool stuff. Uh, in fact, he's brought us some cool stuff before because he was a founding member of the New York General Assembly which was what created Occupy Wall Street. Uh, so he deserves to be for that. Yeah, we actually a very, very much an education activist uh, with uh, you know, low-income and truant kids, and he's the co-principal of the uh, Paul Robeson School. But he's not here to talk about that. Uh, he was here to talk about the economy because he's part of a really interesting project that I'll let him describe to you because it's kind of only partially been unwrapped in a little bit of uh, coverage so far. And that's Occupy Money. So please welcome Justin. Yay, yay. It is well enough that people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system. For if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before the morning. <laughs> that wasn't from somebody at Occupy Wall Street. <laughs> Does anybody know who said that? <laughs> no, it wasn't George Bush. Jefferson. 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 No, it was Henry Ford. Oh. That's right. Henry Ford. Uh, it's becoming ever more apparent that the system is rigged. Um, and rigged to such an extent that it's taking our democracy down with it. Uh, President Jimmy Carter, again, not a very radical anti-capitalist from Occupy Wall Street, said recently, America no longer has a functioning democracy. So it really is coming to a head. And I don't want to talk now about Wall Street, and I don't want to talk about Main Street either. I want to take it to another street, which is Fulton Street in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, where I live. This street, like probably many of the streets uh, that you've lived on or walked on is ground zero in this crisis because the people living on Fulton Street are, I would argue, the ultimate victims of Wall Street fraud. They don't have, uh, on Fulton Street, banks that help the community. They don't have uh, credit unions even on, on Fulton Street. They don't have on Fulton Street anything that's going to turn the existing wealth of the community into something better for the people of Fulton Street. And this pattern is replicated all across the country. If, for example, just briefly, if you bank with Chase Manhattan, Chase J.P. Morgan, that's right, I don't anymore. Uh, but if you do, and you have less than $100,000 in your account and no loans out with J.P. Morgan Chase, you, as a depositor, as a customer, are not profitable to J.P. Morgan Chase. That's just the flat arithmetic reality. You just don't make money for them. It costs them more to have you as a customer than you make for them in their investments. Let alone what their investments are, as we know, chopping the tops off mountains, hydraulic fracturing. We, we know all of that. But they don't even make money off of you at this, in this segment of their customer base. So what are they doing now? They're creating new exotic products to try to squeeze any kind of money out of you that they can. So they create the Chase Liquid prepaid debit card and target people who live on Fulton Street who, who want to be able to have access to their cash. And they charge you fee upon fee and gotcha fee upon gotcha fee in order to try to extract something out of you that they couldn't get from you 
as a savings account or checking customer. And this is just another example of this broader pattern that we all know, which is that this unregulated corporate capitalism is, as a virus, is killing its host. And it's getting harder and harder to extract anything out of it. So it's really just going for anything that it can find. And as Gar said the other day, we're in a, a slow decay that may or may not come to a collapse. I personally think it will. But may or may not come to an ultimate collapse. But this decay is hurting people. And it's especially hurting low income, poor people, unbanked, underbanked people. And so with this in mind, we convened a group called the Alternate, the Alternative Banking Group of Occupy Wall Street, which was setting out to look at what are some alternative ways to do banking that are non-extractive, that actually inject resources into a community rather than take them out, that create wealth for depositors, not just for bankers. And two years later, nearly two years later, we're about to launch the Occupy Money Cooperative. I want to show you a short video. Yeah, it's exciting. That's right. And you're the first audience, actually, to, to hear about this. This hasn't been publicly announced in any venue or forum yet. So you guys are like the first. Uh, I'm about to show you a video, uh, a two-minute video, just to show you and give you a glimpse of the Occupy Money Cooperative and our first financial offering, which is the Occupy Card. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 
All right, we're going to try to get the audio working on this. In the meantime, um, I want to talk really briefly about what is the Occupy Money Cooperative. Um, this, this effort, which has been undergoing now for about two years, uh, is to establish a viable alternative to the existing banking system. That is our ultimate long-term goal, uh, especially for unbanked and underbanked people. If you're already a member of a credit union, uh, you're, you're good. You're in, you're, you're in a much better place than with a Wall Street bank, as we know. And this isn't really intended to replace that. But many people don't even have access in their neighborhood to a credit union. And so what we're trying to do is to create, to recreate the convenience um, that is offered by the large banks. The, act, the, the ability to, for example, have uh, uh, card services, debit and credit card services, to do online banking, all of these things, but in a nonprofit cooperative model. Uh, for example, the first offering that we're going to have is called the Occupy Card. It's a debit card, so there will be no overdraft and there'll, no, there'll be no credit uh, offered on this card. In the future, we would like to offer services like community lending, peer-to-peer -peer lending. And ultimately, uh, we would like to even move off of the existing Visa uh, payment network onto an alternative payment network, like many of you have probably heard of Douala, um, you know, PayPal is an example of trying to, to use an alternative payment method, but there are issues with PayPal as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the notion, as always, is to try to give people the services, the financial services, of the big banks without the extractive policies, the, the, the unregulated, uh, crony capitalist uh, mess that comes along with those uh, those corrupt systems. And you know, one last one last point about that is that you know one of one of the big issues, as we said earlier, is debt. So many people are faced with today enormous debts uh, at every level, from 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 the level of the individual. Although, as we know, you know, debt is not an individual problem. All the way up to the federal level, many of many of these things are really holding people down in a big way from from being contributing members of our economy, from even just living uh, living satisfactory lives. We we started a project called Strike Debt, which many of you are probably familiar with. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and Strike Debt came out of the notion that you are not alone. That that we need to confront debt at a systemic level. And, and recognize that there are many illegitimate debts in our lives, and that really the debts that we owe are to each other, and that we can't wait for the government to give us a, 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 a holiday on our debts. They did that for the banks, they didn't do that for us. But we actually have to come together and support each other through these debts. And so what we did was we bought up, we bought up this distressed debt, medical debt, credit card debt that's weighing people down, became a debt collector and actually canceled this debt entirely. We're in the process, as many of you heard Thomas Gokey say yesterday, of buying even more of that debt. But it's not really an ultimate solution. It brings the spotlight, the focus onto the problem. But the ultimate origin of all this debt, as you know, is Wall Street. And so we need to actually divest. We need to take our money out of Wall Street and create alternative economies for growth. Exactly. So we can, we can eliminate the debt monster in the first place. So the Occupy Money Cooperative is, Cooperative is a natural extension of the strike debt campaign, moving beyond an economy of debt, moving beyond uh, a monetary system of debt, but beginning with something that's actually useful for people. So we made this decision to go with the Visa uh, platform so that people could actually, this could actually be of use and, and empowering for the almost 35 million or 40 million, depending on the study, unbanked people in the United States. These are people that don't have, either because of where they live, because of their income, uh, because of their history, their credit history, or their criminal, so-called criminal history. They don't have access to the financial services that you and I take for granted. Being able to buy something online, for example, that shouldn't be a privilege 
um, of people who have good credit or live in a nice neighborhood. 